G'day, Professor Joseph Drew here. I'm about to start my sixth book, Creating Human Value. And I wondered to myself whether you guys would want to join me on the journey to find out what's involved in the hard graft of writing a scholarly non-fiction book. So my idea is to log the whole process. And I think it'd be invaluable to any young academic thinking about writing a non-fiction book, but any person interested in, in pursuing an academic life or being a student, it's, I'm gonna be speaking a lot about planning and the importance of planning and how to link the ideas together and how to keep interest and how to create a holistic product at the end that has impact. So what, uh, so I think it could be valuable to quite a few people. And if I get enough thumbs up, I'll keep making these videos. So what is this book about? It's called Creating Human Value, A New Public Management Paradigm. And if you watch my videos, you know I'm very much into natural law, philosophy. I teach overseas on this topic and taught in Australia on topic two. And it's been very popular with my students, surprisingly so. Very old, ancient uh, concept goes back to at least the time of Aristotle and Plato. He talks about the proper ends, the proper excellences of human beings. It talks about the proper function of government and helping people achieve those ends. Now, I was requested to do this book and it comes at a, a very pivotal moment, certainly in Western government. We're more fractured than ever. We have more claims of government overreach than ever. We have more welfare dependency, intergenerational welfare dependency than ever. And a lot of that comes back to the fact that government has lost its way. It has lost sight of its purpose. The original purpose of government, you go back to Plato, Aristotle, was to teach people to be virtuous and to help them get to a eudaimonic state, eudaimonia, which literally means a good spirit, a good life, human flourishing, sometimes horribly, mis horribly mistranslated to happiness. And indeed, that's what's happened. Governments focused on happiness instead and equated happiness with spending money and doing things. And that's why we have such large government these days compared to what we had in the past. And the problem with that is it can undermine human dignity. It can undermine all the smaller associations such as families and clubs, religious institutions, social groups, that contribute so much to the good life. So this book is set up as an antidote to the creating public value paradigm, which is holding sway in most Western governments at the moment, which is responsible for a lot of the ill effects that we're seeing. And um, I think it's gonna have a very big impact. So a couple of these steps I already did last year. First of all is to find a niche. And the niche was easy in this case because people actually asked me for this book. Several colleagues and uh, several people who knew me personally thought that it was such an important thing that it really needed to be highlighted in a work of its own. I've talked about it at length in other books of mine, but it really needed a dedicated work. You then need to make the pitch to a book company which is not easy. It was easy for me in this case because I had a long-standing relationship with the editor, a working relationship with the editor at Springer. Springer have always been very good to me, treated me very fairly, and uh, well, one of the best scholarly publishers. I, I'd be mad to go elsewhere. I did think about going elsewhere, to tell you the truth, uh, to a publisher that's a bit cheaper because I wanted to, to um, the book to get greater exposure, and sometimes the Springer books are too expensive for people to buy. But at the end of the day, I realized the most important thing is a good relationship with your chief editor. And that's what I had. Unfortunately, she went and left, joined another company. I think it was Rutledge, which is a huge loss for Springer. And if it had I known it, I probably would have go, gone elsewhere. But I'm confident that Springer will still continue to treat me fairly like they have in the past. That they'll appoint a good editor to take over from Lucy. And I'm very happy with the presentation of their book and, and the typesetting and all those sorts of things. So you make your pitch, and I think it's best to do it with a phone call and talk through it. But you've ha you've got to think all the way through it before you go anywhere near it. anyone. Do not go up to someone with a pitch that's half-baked. And I've had people do that to me before, and I've reviewed half-baked pitches, 
and you get quite scathing reviews and rejections of the density ego and it's no good so think about it for a long time i think I, uh, from memory i i um, thought about this proposal designed it several times designed the pitch several times over the period of three or four months before i was happy enough to make an approach even though i knew the editor I knew that she'd be receptive to this idea then you need to fill out a formal proposal. Every company will have one. It's usually several pages. You've got to suggest referees, talk about how your work fits in uh, to other work out there. So you've got to know what else has been written out there and uh, give a basically write the blurb for the book, give an outline, quite a detailed outline of what you intend on doing every chapter. Don't worry, they don't hold you to that outline if you change your mind slightly later but you can't change it radically so you've got to put a lot of thought into this you put the formal pitch in they'll send it out to get reviewed usually by two scholars then they'll approve or reject it or work with you to build it up to a standard that's good enough and then you'll be sent a contract the contract's a great big document it's DocuSign signed on the computer can't say i've ever bothered to read it all but please be careful that you can negotiate a little bit in the contract you can negotiate with payment you can negotiate with royalties so spring was very good to me gave me additional royalties because i've got a good track record with them you can negotiate on the number of copies yes you get free copies of your book and you'll want several you'll want you know, one for your family one for yourself a working copy and then there'll be some colleagues that you'll want to give books to you know mentors such as i had the great brian dollar he was my mentor uh, bosses when I go overseas the universities that I teach these uh, ideas in will all want a copy of it so you end up needing quite a lot they're not cheap negotiating your contract to get a number of copies I think I asked for eight or ten okay so remember that you've got a little bit of negotiating power they've got to make a profit but they don't pay you an awful lot and the books cost a lot so I think it's a pretty good business proposition from them and of course after you've been successful and you've got a track record this is my sixth book with them well then you're much more likely to to get positive buy into any negotiations that you're going to try so it's really important to start with a good overall comprehensive plan that ties it all together and you'll see that in the next slide it's far too big to put on this slide with everything else uh, and it's very very convoluted now that was like my fourth attempt i'm still not happy with it. i'll have another attempt there's no point starting until you got the plan right because what's going to happen i never get sabbatical like other academics do you're supposed to get six months off every two years to do a project like this i have to fit it in between lectures and consulting and writing papers and everything else i have to do so i'm gonna write a chapter now and then i probably won't get a chance for a month or two it could be well into next year before i finish the book if i don't have a plan it's going to sound like a whole heap of separate little chapters cobbled together it's not going to flow and it's not going to all sink in and that's what's necessary to keep the reader reading so really important to do a good job on that plan you've got to have an interest point i discovered this in my second book saving local government and i started every chapter with a medical story something quirky and unusual so um i talked about xenotransplants when they were taking kidneys out of chimps and putting them into people and wondering why the people died and i used that as the motivation to talk about amalgamation because amalgamation is often like that you take a part of a one species and stick it with another species completely different community and you wonder why the new community dies um for grants and debts i talked about the history of blood transfusion it was first done with lamb's blood and it works fine as long as you don't do more than one transfusion uh, then they they moved on to uh, transfusions lacto transfusions of milk and that didn't work well at all and i use that as a motivation for talking about how if you transfuse money through grants or debt into the patient and you do it too often you can end up with a dead patient i.e a dead local government and i got so many compliments and people told me it really motivated them to read every chapter to see what interesting little story i was going to come up with next and it tied the book together um, and that's what i'm doing in this book also what i did in my last book so this time i'm going to look at some of the great philosophers and sages of history i'm going to look at boethius uh he was a roman senator and philosopher that got jailed uh, on trumped up charges got executed 
that wrote a very famous book about the Wheel of Fortune. I'm going to talk about Tenjin. I hope I said it correctly. He was a Japanese uh, philosopher. He's now a kami, a god. Um, and um, he was also mistreated. And after he died, they had the angry ghost that was visiting all sorts of harms on Japan until they started worshipping and building temples to him. And I'm going to use that as motivation to talk about the old public management paradigms and how they're angry ghosts and visiting all sorts of ills on us. I'm going to talk about Maimonides, his, his dedication to the patients. He literally worked himself to death. And I'm going to use that as motivation for one of my chapters. And then Aquinas is a quirky little story about his family. They didn't want him to be a Dominican. They kidnapped him and, and locked him in a, a castle with a whore all night trying to tempt him out of it. But um, he was true to his virtues, and I think that's going to be the one that motivates the chapter on virtue. So those little stories will keep things moving along, will keep the interest in there, and they all have attributes and aspects of their life that are relevant to what I'll later explicate in the chapter. And you must keep going back to that story that's at the beginning of the chapter during the chapter can't have it hanging out there in open space all by itself and particularly at the conclusion but right throughout the chapter keep referring back to the person and the life and the attributes of that life that illustrate what you're talking about so that will be very important to tie it all together the order of the chapters is very important too and the order within chapters people don't pay enough attention to the order that they present ideas you've got to get the simpler ideas and work your way up to more complicated ideas so it's got to be a logical order that flows and when you repeat the order anywhere it must be repeated in that order and not in a different order so this is like draft number four of my plan and it just gives you an idea of how much detail I'm looking at. So each one of these bubbles is a chapter. Okay, and they're numbered so you can see which order I'm going into. So I start obviously with an introduction, finish with a conclusion. That's pretty straightforward. When talking about natural law, you need to talk about the excellent person because that's a whole point is how do people achieve their full potential, full flourishing. Then you need to talk, obviously, about government, the excellent society, and what the purpose of government is. Then I'm going to talk about extant current public policy theories. That's where they use the tension example. Then I'm going to finally propose my antidote to the problems that we have, which is creating human value, which is in direct confrontation of the current creating public value paradigm and so forth you'll see that in each chapter there's lots of lines coming out each line is probably a section or a subsection of the chapter and then the main things i've got to cover and i've been very careful to present them in a sensible order as well now there's a lot more to be done before i write a chapter i will do a plan that's about as big as this that usually takes me a day and before I write each section of that chapter so each chapter will be split up into five sections or so before I write each section I will do a plan for that section which will take me about half a day maybe a day now as I've told you in other videos there's another video I'm planning you can either spend your time planning and getting a good pr product that's really quick to write so typically you were a paper or a book I'd spend half or certainly with paper, I spend half my time planning, half the time writing, and I can knock over the paper in six days, six to eight working days, which is incredibly quick. So you can spend half your time planning, and it's really quick to write it out because you've already worked out how where everything goes and how it links together and what references you're going to use, etc. So it flows really nice because you can sit down and write it in one lot. Or you can make it up as you go, and it will be all over the place. The order will be different every time you raise issues. It won't flow logically. It will be stunted and stilted as if you keep stopping and starting, because that's what you'll be doing. And it ends up taking longer. That's the irony of it all. Spending time doing a comprehensive plan actually saves you time. But um, occasionally, I used to teach this strategy specifically to my postgrad students, and and some students would take it all on board and they go, wow, I never knew that that's why I had to do to start producing good work, start producing quick work. 
Um, and I sort of stumbled across it over the last couple of decades. Um, but some people refuse to do it. Some people do a half-baked effort, like my younger son at present. I keep encouraging him, no, do it properly, take the time. It's not much more effort and you get a better product. And eventually he will do it properly and he'll probably be converted. But it's well and truly worthwhile. And particularly, as I say, on a, on a big project like a book, it's going to be a year. You can see the ones in red there that I've said that get done this year. And the rest will have to get done next year. It's going to be a couple of years before this gets done. Uh, if I don't have a plan to keep things together and to keep me on the track, I'm going to deviate and get off track all over the place and chase down rabbit holes. And it's going to be a bit of a mess and a very big pain to, to read. Now, will this plan change as I go? Quite possibly. Um, particularly, I think once I, the first couple of chapters, I've done something similar to that before. But by the time I get to chapter four, I'm writing in a new area. It may influence chapter five, and chapter five, which is where I outline the creating human value paradigm, is really the thing that guides all the other chapters after, it, including the two case studies. If you're not, if you're doing a book and you don't have case studies in there, I strongly encourage you to do them. So I have usually, typically in, in a book, two chapters where I look at a real world thing that happened recently and say how my paradigm or my idea or whatever I was talking about in local government would have resulted in better outcomes. And that's actually really hard to do to apply, apply knowledge, but that's that higher order knowledge that Maslow talked about. And it's so important because some of your readers won't be able to do it. And it's really important to test your ideas and test what you're saying in the, in the crucible of the real world. So I'm going to look at creating human value in um, terms of COVID responses, and I'm going to look at creating human value in terms of the fight on inflation. So they're really important chapters too. So the main thing you need to know about writing a book, and I imagine it's the same with fiction, I'm going to try my hand at that in a few years' time when I retire, is this just really hard graft. There's, there's no substitute from the hard slog of going in every day, putting down a couple hundred thousand words, a couple thousand words when you don't feel like it, when you're not in the mood, or when you get sick and you've got a headache or, or you've got the flu or whatever. It's just going to be done. And you get to your goal by plotting day after day after day according to a really clever plan that you've spent a lot of time thinking out. You've got to have a reason to do the book. This is Viktor Frankl's main thing in his logotherapy and something I'm going to be talking about in the book. You've got to have a reason for being, a reason to do the book. And when you're invested and you can see the reason, my reason is to improve the lives of people, to improve the function of government so it starts functioning like it was designed to do. And I think that's going to be terribly important for, for my children and for friends and other people in the community. That's the thing that's going to motivate me in those times when it is hard graph, when I'm trying to fit in a chapter, when I've only got a week or two between jobs or lectures or papers that I've got to review or revise. That's the thing that's going to keep me moving through this. So have a reason, articulate it clearly and stick to that reason. You've got to keep the passion and you've got to have the virtue, one of the four cardinal virtues I'll be talking about at length in the book, which is fortitude, which is keep going when the going gets tough. That's the difference between a successful life and a not successful life. We all have challenges. I certainly had my share. Um, sometimes you just got to grunt it out and a book really teaches you a lot about fortitude. Look, so I hope that video has helped you if you're designing your own book or you just want to better appreciate what my life's like it's quite boring tedious and extremely long hours 10 12 hour days um look if you want to see more of these log videos you've got to give me a thumbs up you've got to subscribe you've got to flick it around to other people that'll be interested actually this whole channel is about helping other people but i'm never going to help them if i can't get the exposure and i can't get the exposure without you helping me by flicking things around liking them and subscribing. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.